<laughs> oh, that is the original skillet dinner. This is the dish that launched a thousand meals. This is the dish whose very existence, although based on traditional Italian agrodolce and Spanish uh, sweet and sour food traditions, uh, is what put one of the most famous food franchises in the world on the map, took the Upper West Side by storm, and because it was cooked on the Upper West Side, New York is cooked by Jews all over the world when they are celebrating the wintertime holidays. And I thought, what better time to make it than now? Because we're going to start heading into all kinds of Thanksgiving stuff next week. Uh, I am Andrew Zimmerman. This is uh, Instagram version of AZ Cooks. Uh, and that is Chicken Marbella. Chicken Marbella. Just the word, it just sounds so beautiful and exotic. So let me tell you a quick little story. Oh, let me first thank our sponsors. Thank you to the good people at Florida Cana Rum. Thank you to the good folks at uh, Halados Mexico, and of course to our partners at, uh, at Shun, makers and purveyors of some of the finest uh, knives on planet Earth. So when I was young, in high school, um, there was a really hot uh, catering company called the Silver Palette. And Sheila Lucan and Julie Rosso had this white hot catering company. I mean, you would go to someone's house and you could smell the silver palate food because everyone requested their signature dish, which was chicken Marbella. So these uh, entrepreneurs uh, got a small little space on the Upper West Side and they opened a takeaway shop, um, a little uh, place with a counter, there'd be a line outside. You couldn't fit more than three or four customers inside. The cases were crammed with roasted artichokes and you know, roasted peppers and beef stew and goulash and gazpacho and curried carrot soup and platters and platters of chicken marbella. And people would line up for this food. And then out came the Silver Palette Cookbook, which I still think today is one of the best-selling cookbooks of all time in America. If you do not own a copy of the Silver Palette Cookbook, you can get, it's in paperback. You can, I'm sure, get it on Amazon for a couple of dollars. Um, it is one of the greatest cookbooks of the last century. It's amazing. Anyway, their dish, Chicken Marbella, became so popular with their clientele that because of who they were and where they were cooking was primarily Jewish, uh, this became sort of like the go-to, uh, and there's no dairy in this, it sort of became the go-to um, Hanukkah and Jewish holiday celebration food. And it is, I, I love the Italian expression of agrodolce in food, which means sweet and sour, right? And uh, this dish begins with marinating the chicken, and I should apologize in advance. We're gonna have an abbreviated version of AZ Cooks tonight, but we're gonna have the bonus version on Tuesday for you, right? Abbreviated tonight, bonus on Tuesday, because we have a whole bunch of holiday events so I hope anyone out there who's watching who wants to see more cooking and share more stuff with me tonight uh, at 7 o'clock Eastern is uh, just go to aarp.org slash caregivers. aarp.org slash caregivers. Caregiving. Uh, caregiving. Thank you, Vicki. And I am hosting a, an event for them nationwide. Uh, tens of thousands of people are going to be tuning in and we're going to be doing some Thanksgiving stuff together. So please, 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 uh, my apologies uh, for the half hour version. Tonight, usually we like to go about 45 minutes. Uh, tonight, we're going to keep it to a half an hour. And uh, But tune into the aarp.org slash caregiving and, uh, and you can see more. Anyway, Chicken Marbella. Very quickly, uh, shallots, oregano, salt, red wine, vinegar, and garlic. And you marinate the chicken parts in that overnight. Then you put it in uh, this pan and you sear it. And then you pour these other ingredients uh, over there. It's really simple. Uh, wine and vinegar, capers, brown sugar, olives, unsulfured apricots, olive oil, not butter, prunes, of course, and then at the end, you sprinkle more brown sugar on it while it roasts, and it is filled with sweet and tart elements to it. Sometimes I'll put some little sliced chilies uh, in there so I get a little chili heat, the fresh bay leaves. This dish is, in my mind, when sheet pan dinners came out and became so popular, I was like, wow, throw a couple carrot sticks and some leeks in there, and you've got the ultimate sheet pan dinner. Um, 
You can do this. I obviously like to do it in a higher sided pot so I get all those juices because it is that olive oil vinegar sauce in there thickened with the fruit and the brown sugar that makes this dish so absolutely fantastic. But you can't make it until you start with your chicken. And here's where the fun part comes in. We've been doing a lot about knife skills, right, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, a few weeks ago, I showed you how to uh, do uh, different cuts uh, of vegetables, uh, batons and alumettes and dice and brunoise. Um, we're gonna do carving uh, next week with a couple different types of roasts that we're gonna cook uh, together. Obviously, it's Thanksgiving week. Um, but I have a washed and dried chicken here, and I'm gonna place it onto uh, this cutting board. And what I wanna show you today very quickly is how to break down a whole chicken. And the reason is this. Uh, really good chickens are now like 12 to $16 a pound, right? For the really good organic chickens uh, by the parts. Uh, but whole, it's still like eight ninety nine, nine dollars bucks. Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, I collect chickens when they're whole chickens when they're on sale and throw them in the freezer. Um, I just like to have them on hand. I cook a lot of chicken. I love chicken. Um, so uh, I break down my parts so that way I have wings and backs so I can make uh, chicken broth for soups and chicken stock for sauces and other things. And it just, it's so much cheaper and the chicken itself is better. I prefer to break down chickens myself. Uh, and it's so, so simple and everyone thinks there's a lot of mystery to it. Um, we washed and dried this chicken. These are the legs, those are the thighs, these are the wings, and these are the breasts. A lot of people really don't know that, so I'm, I'm going slow here. Here's extra fat that you can render if you like. I sometimes tend to keep those attached to the thighs when I cut them um, and then render the fat that way once it's cooked. And I will, uh, because cooked chicken fat tastes different than raw rendered chicken fat. Uh, and I find it much, much better roast like potatoes and stuff with. Um, so the first thing that I do is I take off the dark quarters. There's just skin holding this on, right? I mean, I can just cut that skin away. I have a very, very sharp knife here. And then I just bend and I pop that bone out. And then I use this knife and I go along the backbone and then I turn that in to make sure I get that nice oyster out of there. And I have my dark quarter, right? Super, super simple. You know that you've done a good job when you flatten out your thigh and you see that the two lobes of meat are past that bone. I've gotten all the meat that I can off there. And if there's a little bit of meat left on there, it's fine. That's gonna go on that backbone, that's, stay on that backbone and go into my soup. Now, if you want to cut your legs and thighs apart, if you come in here, the chicken actually tells you where to cut. Do you see that little strip of fat down there? Every chicken, turkey, duck, and goose in the world has a little line there of fat that separates those two. And if you put your knife right there, you will cut right through the softest part of the joint with, without fail every single time. So now you have a thigh, the leg. Again, pop the bone, right? Oh, that bone was broken. Hmm. Not our fault. It happens sometimes. Um, anyway, broken bone in the chicken itself. You see that? No problem. And I'm just going to cut through again and separate the two legs from the two thighs. And then for safety, so I don't jab myself, I'm just going to pull that piece of broken bone out and I'm just going to cut that, set it to the side because I'm going to have all of my backs and my wing tips, right? I'm not really a big fan of the wing tip when I'm cooking chicken wings and I love to eat chicken wings. So I cut those off and just like the legs, you can see where the joint is. That's that, there's the joint right there. So all you want to do is place your knife in between it and push down. And now we have a couple of ounces of bones, meat, and fat. Now, wings go straight down through there. You see the bone? And just, usually I like to turn it towards myself, but I want to show you how to do it. I am a big fan 
of putting a little bit of that breast meat on with the drummy so that the wing is an actual piece. Now this one is gonna be easier for me to cut, uh, maybe tougher for you to see. All I do is I go about an inch in from the edge of the breast and cut straight down right through the joint and I get a nice little extra piece of breast meat on with the flap, the drummy, and now that little extra bit of meat. And so that way the wing is sort of like a, a better piece. Now you can see here we have this backbone and I encourage people, I use shears all the time and for folks who have seen me cooking and for those of you who've seen videos of me breaking down poultry, I sometimes do uh, entire um, turkeys. I'm gonna do one next week just using a scissor and a little parry knife, but there's a nice meaty backbone, right? And I want that to go into what's making, what will be my bag of bones to make stock with. So then we have this double breast, right? And you can cut straight down through there and you have two bone on chicken breasts. And that's how I like to cook the chicken Marbella. And the reason is, is that I think chicken cooked on the bone tastes better. It also takes longer to cook. And the reason why that's good is that it has more time to stay in contact with the heat source, in this case, the oven, which is why it's so brown and crispy and roasty and toasty. If it was a boneless chicken leg and a boneless breast, they would be overdone by the time they look so roasty, toasty, and crispy. Make sense? A lot of people like to take meat off of their bones. And I would tell you that all you have to do, whether you're using a bony knife or a large chef knife like chef, chef's knife like this, is press the tip of your knife against the bone and let the bones of the chicken tell you where to go. Just hold on to the meat. I have my knife literally at a five degree, if that. I'm going parallel, parallel, parallel to the bones, right? So now I have that breast cage out and I have a boneless skin on chicken breast. Now, peel the skin off, put that there, and you have a boneless, skinless chicken breast. Now it's trimmed, because I've taken that little piece of fat off. Now, flip it over. There's the chicken tender. Some people like tenders. And here is your whole boneless, skinless chicken breasts. Is that and a knife? If you want to stuff them, you can open up a flat and stuff them. If you want to do pyards, just cut them in half, hit them with your hand, flatten them. It's also a great way to fly, uh, fry or saute boneless chicken. And so there you have all the different cuts that you're going to need. Oh, two quick ones to let you know. God, we're doing really good on time. I'm gonna get to your questions in a second. Uh, a lot of times recipes call for boneless thighs uh, and people always ask me, how do I do that? I just take the bone, the meaty part of the thigh, I lay it in my hand. I put the skin down in my, in my cross my fingers. And I just take my knife and I like to keep my knife nice and sharp for these reasons. And I just scrape it there. I can actually feel the bone. It just peels away from there. And then all you have to do, take the very tip of your knife. So you see I'm choking up, choking up on the knife so that I have really good control over the tip. And all I'm doing is just literally, I'm putting the back of my knife against the bone and I'm just cutting. And then finally at the end, scraping the meat down because that meat is so valuable. I don't like to waste anything. Then you just cut right around the base of it and there is the bone. Here is your boneless skin on chicken thigh. You can peel the skin off if you want, but these are also great to roll and stuff or to cut in quarters uh, for putting on shish kebab. So there's how you bone that. 
And then, of course, people are always asking me, well, if I have a wing or if I have a leg, how do we French those? And all I do is I just rotate my knife by turning. I'm not moving the knife, you see that? But I'm just pulling the chicken leg against the knife blade and just pull that little knuckle right off there. Again, great for stock, but there you have a piece of chicken if you're frying, if you're browning and braising, where that meat will shrink from it and you'll get that sort of lollipop effect that everybody is looking for. For those of you that really like to get fancy, you can French it. I don't do it with this knife, I do it with my cleaver. Do I have a heavier knife? I do. But all you do is cut that end off and you can do that fancy sort of Frenched bone look to it. You can do the same thing, by the way, with drummies if you're separating those as you do with the legs. But this is a very nice presentation if you're doing some piece of sauteed chicken with the sauce marsala and mushrooms and you braise the legs separately and you serve these together. It's a wonderful, wonderful look. But again, for chicken marbella, oh, all of this stuff into a bag. This is about 12, 14 ounces of chicken bones and scrap. When you get five chickens worth of them, you'll be somewhere between four and five pounds worth of scrap. That's when I make a pot of stock, five pounds of these bones. A dark stock comes from roasting these bones and then adding the liquid. We're gonna do that after the first of the year when we start getting into soups and things like that and some other stews. Uh, or you can start them raw and you'll get a, uh, a lighter uh, stock, one that doesn't have that roasty toasty flavor and is probably a little more versatile to use. I more often than not will use a light stock versus one with roasted bones. Uh, but I gotta be honest with you, a lot of the times I'll do raw chicken bones along with two or three uh, veal bones that I roast. So I get a little bit of both and I make a multi-purpose uh, stock. Let me wash my hands, then we're gonna talk and answer your questions. All right. What do you got? How much did I confuse you? Okay, so someone asked, can I marinate slash season chicken and bag it up overnight? And must I make small piercings in the flesh so the seasoning would fully infuse? Don't make piercings. People who jab their food all over, no, 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 no. Just marinate it and yes, I use Ziploc bags because I can use less quantity of marinade. Uh, when I'm making chicken marbella, I'll put all these pieces into the bag with these ingredients. You see there's actually very little liquid and that way the liquid has full contact with the chicken and every six, eight hours, I'll just flip the bag around or massage it a little bit. Everything will penetrate in. Everything will penetrate in. You don't need to do anything extra. You don't need to jab it or cut it or pound it to get the marinade to take on the meat. What's the best temperature and time to cook chicken and keep it moist? Well, it's, it's actually not as much about the, the time and temperature as it is about the size and temperature of the chicken before it goes in. Uh, I always let my meat come to room temperature. Uh, when it's pieces, I typically brown them first, like this recipe. Uh, they're browned in the pan uh, before they're put into the roaster to finish cooking uh, in the oven. In this particular case, they're brined in the vinegar. They actually absorb the vinegar. Uh, typically when you put the pieces in and let it sit in this marinade for, you know, 12, 24, 30 hours, whatever it is, um, you'll almost have no vinegar uh, left. The chicken will have absorbed all of that liquid. Um, so you get a little bit of extra benefit from. I, I, I like to teach people who are cooking poultry for the first time, use an instant read thermometer. They are so sophisticated these days. For 10 bucks, you can get one on Amazon that will, that will be tried and true. And then you'll get to know it by feel and you'll get to see it by how the meat shrinks back from the edges. I can see the tendons in there have pulled back. You can see right through there. See how the tendons have pulled back underneath the skin? That's a great sign that the dark meat is done. Um, 
But you want your white meat, well, white meat is finished at 155, 158 degrees, and then you take it out and let it rest and it goes above 160, which is a food safe temperature for chicken. Dark meat does not become tender until it's 170 to 175 degrees. So I usually give my dark meat a head start and I'll brown it for longer. And if I'm roasting whole birds like turkeys, you'll, well, I'm not gonna give it away because I have the all time best turkey hack that's coming your way uh, next week. You're gonna, you're gonna have to stick around for it. Are you using a shoe knife? And what is your favorite knife that you have? Wow, uh, yes, these are all shun knives uh, right here. That's what we use for AZ Cooks. It's one of my favorite knives. I was using shun before they came on as a sponsor. Same with the uh, Halados Mexico and same with Florida Cana Rum. Uh, I, I'm lucky, I'm privileged that I get the opportunity to work with brands that I, I personally use in my, in my private life. Um, that being said, uh, <laughs> and this is really embarrassing, um, I probably have 60, 70 blades of mine here in the back office, another eight or nine in my front office, and probably another 100 or so at home. But that's because as a chef over the years, I've collected knives, and there are a lot of great knife makers out there, and I see their work, and I like their handles, I like how they feel, there are certain types of steel come along, and I get to use and, and utilize those. Um, I'm a big, big, big fan of supporting uh, folks in the metal crafting business, and I've been fortunate to know a lot of them for a long time, so I have some really, really, really cool knives from some incredible knife makers. And I don't want to name any names because everyone's going to get upset and jealous. Can you eat undercooked chicken just like undercooked steak? Uh, well, under, there's no such thing as undercooked steak because you can eat it raw and you can eat chicken raw as well. It just depends on where you're getting your chicken from. I did a demo at Bottle Rocket last year uh, out in uh, Napa, the, the big music festival where I did chicken sashimi, which is very popular in Japan. But you have to get essentially as close to a wild chicken as you can, one that does not have the salmonella that factory raised birds do. Um, and at that point, you actually dip uh, the breasts into boiling water uh, for a count of two or three. It just briefly turns them opaque so any surface bacteria is gone, and then you thinly slice the meat. Um, I keep really good chickens like that around in the freezer, uh, but I think chicken tastes best. Uh, and while I do like chicken sashimi, I'm not gonna lie, chicken tastes best when it's just to the point of being cooked perfectly. If you go a degree or two over, it can start to get dry and dark meat can actually start to get dry and a little tough as well. So cooking poultry is really tricky. For those that are getting ready for the Thanksgiving holiday, we have a whole primer on roasting whole birds. We're gonna talk about it on Tuesday of next week. Uh, I'm gonna have a roasted turkey here and show you how to carve it. Uh, but uh, the most important thing to do is to go on to andrewzimmern.com. We have a whole Thanksgiving widget, whatever you want to call it. It's like a zine. It's a whole set of recipes and it gets you going two, three, four days out. Even though we're not convening in groups this year, um, I'm still making the full Thanksgiving deal and I'm going to take food around to different friends and families who, who don't cook and need the food. Um, this is going to be a Thanksgiving like no other that we've ever had. So many Americans have lost a loved one. So many Americans have lost a job. We can't travel. We can't congregate. We've been filled with anxiety and uncertainty for a while now. Uh, and then COVID-19 hit, uh, subtle. And so this is a really, really tough time. I know I was looking forward to being with my family. It's my favorite holiday of the year, along with Passover, because it's all about food and it's no presents at all. Uh, and we're not able to do it this year. Uh, so we're just gonna double up on Thanksgiving for next year and we're gonna hunker down. I'm gonna hunker down through New Year's. We have to mitigate and contain this virus that we can get our economy back and get our country jump-started again and uh, really be able to celebrate uh, what it means uh, to be grateful um, in a new way this year. Aside from grilling, what is the best thing? And what the, what the hell is it? I need more votes on the beard thing. It's getting wild and out of control. I need to, I'm going to trim it this weekend. I promise. I know I keep saying that. I'm going to do it. Sorry. Last question. 
Aside from grilling, what is the best thing to do with a chicken breast? Uh, well, I actually don't think, a chicken breast will dry out on the grill. I will pound my chicken thin and do a paillard where I'll just touch it on the grill, really hot direct heat and get some grill marks on it and serve it with ponzanella salad. Great recipe on andrewzimmer.com. But with chicken breasts, uh, boneless or bone in, um, I like things like chicken, the classics, chicken piccata, chicken marsala, all of those, you know, integral sauces, pan sauces, where the chicken is browned and braised in a small amount of liquid just for 8, 10, 12 minutes till the chicken is cooked through and there's a delicious sauce with it. Also recipes on my website. I'm a big, I know it's old school. Recently, I've been getting it, chicken marsala with mushrooms has just been like, mm. the, the minute the cold weather turned with some, with some homemade egg noodles, it's fantastic. Oh, other big news. I'm talking to some chef friends of mine and uh, starting hopefully in December, but for sure in January, because the holidays, everyone's sort of maxed out. Uh, we are going to be joined uh, by a famous food personage uh, at, towards the end of our Instagram lives, uh, and they will settle a debate or dispute uh, with me. Um, it's gonna be super, super fun, and they'll probably teach you a, ting a thing or two uh, from their kitchens as well. It's going to be a really cute new thing uh, that we're doing. So tell all your friends. Cool recipes, my obnoxious BS, and then my friends are going to show up, uh, most of whom you will recognize. Uh, Vicky, and, Vicky and Sean are saying we have to go because we have our tech check for AARP. So here's the deal. Chicken Marbella, make this. Recipe is on our website. How to butcher a chicken. You just saw it. We're going to put the uh, video up on our YouTube. So please subscribe to our YouTube so you can spread the love around. Big, big shout out to all of our sponsors. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Shun, uh, Halados, Mexico, Florida, Kanya. Next Thursday is Thanksgiving. We won't be here. So we're doing our Thanksgiving Instagram Live on Tuesday at five o'clock. So please be there. We're going to run down all your Thanksgiving questions. We will stay as long as we possibly can and answer all of your questions. I love you people to death. Chicken Marbella, Silver Palette Cookbook. See you next Tuesday. AARP.org slash caregiving is where I'm going to be in half an hour. See you later.